I'll just remain here to introduce uh, with a great pleasure again our second keynote speaker of uh, today's program, um, Rasmus Kleis Nielsen, the director of uh, research at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford. Uh, at the same time, he is uh, editor in chief of uh, the International Journal of Press and Politics. His work focuses on uh, changes in the news media, political communication, and the role of digital technologies in these areas. Rasmus has uh, done extensive research on journalism, American politics, and various forms of activism, as well as comparative work in the field of political communication in Western Europe and beyond. His book titled uh, Ground Wars, Personalized Communication in Political Campaigns was published by Princeton University Press in 2012 to a high critical acclaim. Among uh, other prizes, it won the 2014 Doris Graber Award, uh, awarded by the political communication section of the American Political Science Association. Rasmus has recently authored and co-edited several other books, including The Changing Business of Journalism and Its Implications for Democracy, or Political Journalism in Transition, Western Europe in a Comparative Perspective. He's a frequent speaker at academic and uh, industry conferences around the world, and in recent years he has taught at uh, several global universities, uh, including Columbia University, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, uh, or, and of course, University of Oxford. Today he's going to talk about platforms and publishers coming to terms with a new digital media environment. Rasmus, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Vaslav. Thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation and to Joanna for the uh, previous uh, keynote lecture. What is the continued uh, global rise of platforms like Google um, and Facebook mean for the for public communication in a new digital media environment and for how we research and understand public communication. I think that's one of the central questions that's facing the field of communication research today. And what I'll do to the, in this lecture is I'll want to examine the relationship between publishers, news media organizations, and platforms, uh, large technology companies like Google and Facebook, as one key part um, of how the rise of digital intermediaries is playing out. By platforms, um, I mean large technology companies that first have developed and maintain digital platforms that enable interactions between at least two different kinds of actors, typically users and advertisers, but often more um, than this, that in the process of developing and maintaining these platforms, uh, come to host public information, organize access to it, and create new formats for it, and thirdly, thereby influence incentive structures around investment in public communication, including news production. Outside of China, of course, um, the most important platforms are all Silicon Valley-based, publicly traded, for-profit US companies, including not only Google and Facebook that I will talk about today, but also Amazon, Apple, and in some important respects, Microsoft. Coincidentally, these five companies are, um, by this quarter, uh, the five most valuable publicly traded companies in the world. Now, it's important to note here, of course, that the term platform, with its sort of connotations of providing an open and neutral and disinterested playing ground, is a problematic term here. Um, but by now, it is so widely used in discussions of these actors that to avoid it, I think, seems pretentious. But I will supplement it, if you will, with the term uh, digital intermediaries to underline how central parts of both the public role and business model of these companies has to do with the position that they occupy between different actors in the di digital media environment. In my re area of research, for example, between political campaigns and citizens, or between news media um, and news users. Um, but these sort of particular empirical areas simply reflect my own interest in journalism and political communication. Um, but I think that this issue, and I hope the analysis that I will present today, um, um, will be relevant also for colleagues working in other areas uh, of ICREA, whether crisis communication, science and environment communication, or many of the other sections represented uh, at this conference. So based on uh, empirical evidence from a research project that I'm working on with my colleague, Sarah Ganta, uh, I will show today how news media organizations are becoming simultaneously empowered by and dependent upon a small number of centrally placed and powerful platforms that are largely beyond their control. Now, Google and Facebook are increasingly central to much of what we do online. 
They are, in fact, I think by now so integral and so ubiquitous that it is easy to forget just how young these companies are. Google, of course, was founded in 1998. Um, its stated mission was to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. The most popular and widely used search engine in the world since 2000, the company is now active in many other areas. In its 2004 initial public offering, it declared, we began as a technology company and have evolved into software, technology, internet, advertising, and media company all rolled into one. It has since expanded even further, of course, by acquiring the video sharing site YouTube in 2006, the advertising platform DoubleClick in 2008, launching the mobile operating system Android in 2008, social networking services like Google Bus launched in 2010, Google Plus in 2011, cloud computing services, artificial intelligence, and many, many other activities. Um, through all these different activities, Google provides a platform for hundreds of thousands of developers and other third actors, uh, third parties around the world, working across hundreds of different kinds of products, including advertising, cloud computing, games, mobile, video, web, and much, much more. Reorganized as Alphabet in 2015, the company uh, had a market capitalization of about $550 billion, uh, around uh, 55,000 employees as of mid-2016, and reported $75 billion in revenues for the year 2015. So in less than 20 years, uh, it has grown to become the second largest publicly traded company in the world by market capitalization after Apple. Facebook, the other platform I'll talk about today, was founded in 2004. Uh, like Google, the company is not shy about its ambitions to give people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. Um, Facebook overtook MySpace as the most popular social networking site in 2009. I was actually shocked when I read that. I thought that would have been much earlier. It seems so long ago. And has since spread well beyond its core social networking services. It launched Facebook Platform in 2007 for third-party developers, chat functions in 2008, Video chat in 2011, Facebook apps in 2012, it has acquired Instagram in 2012, and in 2014 acquired uh, the messaging apps WhatsApp and the virtual reality company Oculus VR. As with Google, uh, Facebook enables tens of thousands of developers and third parties working across advertising, analytics, games, marketing, strategic communication, and media. It held its initial public offering in 2012, valued $104 billion at the time, the highest valuation ever for a newly listed company. And as of the middle of 2016, Facebook had a market capitalization of $360 billion, 13,000 employees, and reported $18 billion in revenues for 2015. It is the fifth largest publicly traded company in the world by market capitalization comparable to, for example, ExxonMobil, the energy giant. Now, Google and Facebook, uh, of course, are in part big companies because of their wide reach. Uh, Google has uh, seven products with more than 1 billion users globally. Facebook has 1.8 billion users globally of its uh, main platform, and about 1 billion WhatsApp users and another half billion Instagram users, some overlaps, of course. Based on its growth and its user base in 2016, so far, it will add another net 23,000 new additional users during this 30-minute keynote lecture. These platforms have a reach on a scale that was unimaginable in the pre-digital environment. No media organization in history has ever had such reach. Their success uh, is in part about the quality of their products. I use Google and Facebook every day, and I enjoy doing so. And speaking as a user, they make my life easier and they make my life better. The internet and the World Wide Web help make information and digital services available, but it's search engines and social media that have helped make information and services more accessible, more useful, more convenient, and more compelling, and of course in the process have built enormous user bases. This success in turn has helped them dominate the digital advertising market. Google alone accounts for an estimated 30% of digital advertising globally, and Facebook uh, about 13%. Some of this I should note is shared with third parties, but how much is unclear. And everybody else, uh, the orange bar, uh, is competing for the rest. So they have, in a relatively short period of time, grown much, much larger than any uh, let us say, media organization in terms of reach, in terms of revenues, and in terms of market value. And the way in which these platforms have become um, central to so much of what we do with digital media is evident also in how people find and access 
news online, something we track in the Reuters Institute Digital News Report. In many countries now, we find that more people say that they find and come across news online via search engines or social media than by going direct to the websites or apps of news media organizations. These are just a few of the countries we cover in the report. So this is in part about the rise of what we might think of as distributed discovery, where people increasingly come across and find news and information via intermediaries like search engines and social media through search results with links, through links posted uh, on, on Facebook in the news feed. And indeed, by mid-2016, the audience analytics company Parsley estimated that Facebook and various Google site, sites each accounted for about 40% of all referral traffic to, to the publishers in Parsley's network, with Yahoo at a distant third, generating less than 4% of referrals, and Twitter at fourth, uh, at about 2% of all referrals. But beyond distributed discovery, it's also about increasingly the rise of distributed content, where people uh, can use news and information on the platforms themselves without actually going to the public or publisher or originator behind it. So here, for example, a result from Google's knowledge graph where you can see the results of the US presidential elections um, in the search results themselves without actually clicking on anything or going to any other website. Or uh, the example from Facebook, which could have been an instant article, but in this case is a video posted by the Huffington Post that can be consumed entirely within the Facebook environment. How have publishers reacted to the rise of these platforms? Um, there are many questions that surround the, rise of the that surround the rise of the platforms. How we use them, what kind of content we come across, uh, uh, how we as media users understand the processes and perhaps the interests behind the content and the services that we use, how they fit with our policy and regulatory frameworks. But there are also institutional and organizational questions like the question of what the rise of intermediaries mean for news media an institution that uh, most of us have historically relied upon as one of our main sources of information about public affairs. And it is part of a larger ongoing research project here that I'm pursuing with Sarah um, that we will, where we're examining how different kinds of news organizations in different countries are dealing with the rise of intermediaries and how these platforms in turn are thinking about and handling their relationship with publishers. And of course, the first thing we should note here is that there's no one way in which this is happening. Publishers have reacted in quite different ways to the rise of platforms. We might think of a continuum between, on the one hand, organizations like digital-born news organizations like BuzzFeed or legacy media organizations like The Guardian who have embraced the idea of distributed discovery and distributed content and increasingly pursue an off-site strategy to reach a very large audience. And on the other hand, both digital-born news sites like Media Part in France or legacy media organizations like The Times in London who still pursue an on-site strategy insisting on focusing on trying to develop a direct relationship with their users and mainly use intermediaries for marketing purposes. In terms of how news organizations have reacted to the rise of digital intermediaries, uh, we can identify three basic types of responses. Coexistence, confrontation, and collaboration. Now, all of these are reactive in the sense that the most important digital intermediaries are changing the very nature of the media environment in which other organizations operate, and that their actions in turn are largely in response to these changes, but of course they still differ in important ways. First of all, most news organizations have opted for coexistence with digital intermediaries that they increasingly rely on, never fully understand, and have little leverage with. As one interviewee uh, said, we need Facebook, Facebook does not need us. Second, some organizations uh, like News Corps in the US and the UK and Axel Springer in Germany have on occasion opted for confrontation uh, with the platforms. Both of them have tried to confront, for example, Google over the use of snippets in search results and on Google News. Both have backed down as traffic to their websites dropped when they opted out through robot exclusion protocols. And of course, none of them have been consistently confrontational in the sense that many News Corps titles have worked on search and social media, even as their executive chairman called these very same platforms thieves, parasites, and content kleptomaniacs, uh, coincidentally often on another platform, Twitter. Third, some news organizations have gone for active collaboration. At the invitation of the intermediaries themselves, of course, it takes two to collaborate, but this is the view that this can be a win-win. So what I want to do now is to show what collaboration can look like using the case of a large European news organization with a strong digital presence and a relatively solid revenue base. The case that I will talk about is a strategic case study in three ways. First, it is large and strong digital, so it is not forced into reactive coexistence the way that, for example, a local newspaper might be. 
Second, it is European, so it's operating in a political environment where the intermediaries are under scrutiny by competition authorities for their tax practices and over data and privacy issues and the like. And third, it has a relatively solid revenue base, so it is not forced into short-term thinking by existential threats. I will keep both the organization and the individual interviewees anonymous because this relationship is very high stakes and very difficult. The case, I think, illustrates how even active collaborators who start from a strong position, who have embraced intermediaries and the opportunities that they afford, have a good working relationship with them and have demonstrably benefited from these relations, still struggle with aligning their short-term operational goals with their longer-term strategic priorities and have a relationship that is characterized by a fear of missing out, by difficulties of evaluating the risk-reward ratio of embracing intermediaries, and by a profound sense of asymmetry. And I will go through each of these uh, features quickly and illustrate them with uh, interview quotes. So first, from the case organization. Um, one social media editor underlined for us in an interview, we have a good relationship with these companies. We talk to them regularly, they talk to us, we share products like, and if they got a product, ideas, developments, you know, they'll talk to us about them, and if we got things that we are keen to do, we will talk to them. But in practice, despite this good relationship, there is a clear tension between the operational and the strategic approach. Operationally, the approach is a sort of a let's try and see. It's quite incremental, it's quite experimental, it's eager, uh, sometimes driven by the newsroom, and it can be relatively short term. Whereas strategically, there are much harder edge negotiations between the publisher and the different platforms. Uh, people see a real potential here and the sort of the desire to reach more people and to reach them where they are, but also worries over the end game and the longer term prospect of this. And both of these sort of tensions, these tensions between the short term and the long term, the operational and strategic, are captured um, in, a, in an interview uh, quote from a senior online editor who have both operational and strategic responsibilities. The person in question told us, we generally have a let's try and see approach. There are absolutely people in the newsroom and in the teams who just want to get on with it and make use of these, in some cases, great new tools, new platforms to get more of their journalism out. And they're really not too fussy about how or where, and the more the merrier, really. And credit to them for spotting those opportunities and thinking creatively about how to get their material out. Though I think at a more kind of strategic level, yes, there is a lot more deliberation about how much effort we should expend on that kind of activity. In practice, um, both the short-term operational and the longer-term strategic engagement is characterized by a profound fear of missing out. So in an interview with a senior strategy person, I ran an observation by the interview person uh, that I had deduced from our previous uh, interviews and conversations, and I said, um, in one sense, I have from our interviews is that the way the platforms approach major publishers is that they come and say, we have this thing, it's gonna be amazing, we can't tell you exactly how or why, you wanna be part of it, and it would be very bad for you not to be part of it. Is this broadly, and this is where the interviewee interrupts me and says, yes, that is exactly that. But if I was there, that's what I would do too. It is exactly that push. This fear of missing out is combined with the difficulty of evaluating how the relationship is actually working out. So a senior social media editor who works every day and closely with the platform says, you might see a very large number and you might think this is extraordinary, but when you actually look at it and break it down, what you're actually seeing is what the social media company might want you to see rather than what is actually a value to you as a publisher. Fundamentally, the relationship is seen as very asymmetrical and this is in a case involving a large, digitally strong media organization with a solid revenue base. Longer term, especially the strategy people feel that the case organization has very limited leverage with the digital intermediaries, despite its relatively strong position. So I asked a senior strategy person, what kind of hand do you feel you have to play with these people? And the person in question says, honestly, very limited is the absolute truth of it. I guess what I mean is that the absolute it's wonderful to have a window where we feel we can influence things a bit more, but I wouldn't want to overstep what, sand, what sort of hand we have. More broadly, I think this speaks to some of the existential threats and concerns that people have about the success of their own destinations, their own websites, and their own apps. So basically, intermediaries act, and news organizations react. Platforms control their own roadmap, make their own decisions on the basis of their perceived self-interest and the perceived interest of their various users, as can be seen with the sometimes drastic changes to algorithms that leave publishers surprised and reeling from the impact on their reach and visibility. Now, the logic of generalization here from this case study is that we have a strategic case organization in a relatively privileged position that is becoming increasingly dependent upon digital intermediaries that it has a very asymmetrical relationship with. And if this is the case with a very privileged organization, other news organizations in less privileged positions are likely to be even more dependent upon them. 
we know from industry research that large media organizations are far more likely to be destination sites and have large app install bases and therefore relatively less reliant on referrals and off-site reach, whereas smaller media organizations generally have far less direct traffic and rely far more on search and social for reach. So as a range of different intermediaries, including search engines, social media, and increasingly messaging apps, sometimes owned by the same companies and integrated at the back end, become more and more important in terms of how people access and find information online, and in turn restructure the digital media environment itself, I think communication research is faced with a set of interlocking questions concerning both our intellectual work and our public role. The intellectual questions uh, include the need to understand media use and literacy, how people use these platforms to engage with public communication of various kinds, political questions concerning policy responses, but also organizational and institutional ones, like how other players, such as publishers, have reacted to the rise of platforms and how the platforms, in turn, have dealt with them. In terms of media use, and in particular the role of publishers, uh, I think the first implication might be the rise of what we could call platformed publishing. So a development where news organizations have far less control over distribution of online journalism that they had in the past, but may reach much wider audiences because they publish to platforms defined by coding technologies, business models, and cultural conventions over which they have little influence. And we should know this is very, very different from earlier print and broadcast environments, but also from a web 1.0 distribution environment where media organizations controlled both content and channels and built both their power, their profitability, and their public role on doing so. Today, publishers still control the content. They are still incredibly important, but platforms increasingly control many of the channels via which media users arrive at this content. So the second implication then, I think, is that at the organizational and institutional level, previously powerful and relatively independent institutions like the news media are increasingly in a position that is not unlike that of us as ordinary users, as described by Jose van Dijk in her excellent book, The Culture of Connectivity, in that they are becoming increasingly simultaneously empowered by and dependent upon a small number of centrally placed and powerful platforms that are largely beyond their control. So at the highest level of theoretical abstraction, we might see this as a, and this would be the third implication, an intensification of the trend that Anthony Giddens associated with late modernity. So a world that provides us with more and more opportunities, but also a world we do not understand, we feel, or control. And this is an intensification of this process in the sense that it underlies how not only we as individual citizens, but also social and political institutions like the news media are becoming dependent on disembedded technological systems that are developed by individual private for-profit companies. And if the rise of platforms is influencing publishers, news media organizations who have historically occupied a very privileged position in the media environment, the rise is likely to be equally important for many other actors in political communication, whether social movements, political campaigns, uh, government agencies, or other businesses for that matter. It is increasingly true that every organization is also a media organization, but not every organization is a dominant digital intermediary. More and more organizations have to contend with the role of platforms in our public information environment. This means that platforms are powerful in the most basic sense of having the capacity to make a difference and to change the world. Um, I think they are powerful in three different ways, uh, one of which sets them apart from publishers and many other powerful institutions. Um, first, platforms have hard power. They have economic and political power that they can use to influence or prevent decisions. Secondly, platforms exercise soft forms of power through sort of cultural power that work through attraction more than force. But third, large technology companies also exercise specific forms of what we might think of as platform power that publishers and other large and otherwise powerful organizations do not have. I think the most important aspects of uh, platform power might include the power to set standards that others in turn uh, have to abide by if they want to be part of the social and technical networks that the platforms enable, the power to make and break connections within these networks by changing social rules, community standards, or technical protocols like search and social ranking algorithms, the power of automated action at scale as their technologies enable and shape billions of transactions and interactions all over the globe every day. 
the power of secrecy as they operate as black boxes where outsiders can only see input and output on the basis of limited and selectively released data and only the platforms are privy to how the processes work and have access to more comprehensive data. And the power to operate across domains where the success of, for example, a social networking site can in turn be used to promote a new standalone messaging app where as a default you are always locked in. Data from this messaging app can then in turn be used to further refine the placement of content and advertising on the social networking side, which then makes it more attractive to various third parties, including developers, advertisers, and publishers, and perhaps the users themselves. I think platform power is a specific and increasingly important instantiation of what David Graval has called network power, power that is driven by two dynamics. First, that platforms become more valuable to more users, the more users use them leading to very powerful economies of scale and network effects. And secondly, that this dynamic in turn over time gives them advantages that can lead to the progressive elimination of alternative which users could in principle choose to use instead. Now, it's important to underline that these forms of platform power are deeply relational and not fixed resources that the platforms possess and can use at their own pleasure. If they could, um, all of you would be checking your Google Plus profile on your Google Glasses now. But platforms succeed commercially and come to exercise power through associations by enabling interactions. Each of us and every publisher and many, many other third actors help make platforms powerful because they empower us in very specific ways when we use them and their attractive products and services. These forms of power are profoundly enabling they are transformative, they are productive forms of power in all the senses of these terms from Michel Foucault and Bruno Latour. And they're based on relations between users and platforms. But they are forms of power nonetheless and tied to the institutional and strategic interests of the platforms themselves. I want to be clear here, um, I do not mean to suggest that the rise of platforms and the implications for publishers is, to use a highly theoretical concept, a bad thing. Um, or for that matter, that this development is sort of the, the end of journalism and democracy as we knew it, whatever that was. Um, I think this development is too big and too complex to be simply good or bad. I don't know, I don't think we know, and I don't think anybody knows what exactly this means, which is why I think this is such an exciting and interesting time to do communication research. The questions we face are urgent and profound, and there are so many opportunities, not only for new empirical work, but also for theoretical and methodological innovation that can help us understand a changing environment. What does gatekeeping mean in a world where we both have many more gatekeepers at the level of content production, but also very few, very large gatekeepers at the level of content discovery? Can we do a framing analysis of a snippet seen via search or social? How can we understand media effects through exposure to content if that exposure increasingly takes the form of a multitude of fleeting encounters, algorithmically filtered and delivered via always on and always on me media? What does content analysis mean in an environment with more and more automated personalization, geolocation, and responsive design? How do we do interview-based and uh, research and ethnographic fieldwork of social technical practices that are often in large part playing out at the logistical back end and are seemingly invisible and sometimes poorly understood by us as researchers but also by those who rely on them and work with them. Communication research deals in part with timeless questions. How do people share symbols in time and space? Why and so what? But we also deal with timely questions and indeed many of the most important founding figures in our field, uh, however you uh, trace your own lineage, whether it's you know, from the Chicago School or the Columbia School in the US or the Frankfurt School or our French uh, friends in Paris, were intensely interested in bringing independent research and new theories and methods to the study of the big issues of their time. And I believe we are living through a similar critical juncture to the one faced by many of these people um, uh, directly comparable to the economic, social, political, and technological turmoil of the 1930s. And I believe it's incumbent on us collectively to take it on intellectually. No other field of social science or humanities research will do it. And maybe this is our chance 
to give back to those fields from which we have learned and borrowed so much. And I've been very inspired in this respect by some of the panels that I've attended this very conference. I hope we will do this in a way that is oriented not simply at improving our shared understanding of an opaque and rapidly evolving set of processes profoundly reshaping our media environments, but also help citizens and decision makers understand it. And I think this means finding a balance between the standards and practices and pace of scientific research and publication as we know it, and a willingness to do and share research in internet time, publishing not only through the scholarly channels that serve our interests, and the interest of our university administrators, but also through accessible and timely channels that can help us effectively bring evidence-based findings to the attention of citizens and decision makers trying to navigate an uncertain and changing world. I know we can do it, and I hope we can do it together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rasmus. Uh, thank you very much for this very illuminating talk, for walking us through the rapidly changing media environment and reminding us of the rising power of the new platforms. I'm sure there are many questions. Uh, the floor is open. Who would like to ask first? I'm Stefan Rusmol from the Universita della Svizzera Italiana. Uh, Rasmus, I uh, liked your presentation very much. I think it was a great overview uh, and I also like particularly that, that you uh, addressed questions of power which our colleagues rarely do in their uh, research. However, at the very end I had the feeling that you escaped a little bit when you said we are not talking about the end of journalism and the end of democracy as we know it. Uh, I'm afraid we are exactly talking about the end of journalism and the end of democracy as we know it, given the power of these five uh, giant teenagers, as Natasha Just, a colleague from Zurich, put it uh, recently. So please, can you clarify, uh, is it really not the end of democracy and the end of journalism as we have known it so far? <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Stefan, um, and thanks for this opportunity to clarify that. Um, there is no question that the institutions of news and journalism that sustain professional journalism in the Western world in the 20th century have been profoundly dislocated, uh, in, in part by the success of platforms, um, and this is a dramatic change. What I meant by saying that, and thanks for the opportunity to clarify that, is that I personally am very reluctant to jump to the conclusion that that means that that is the primary and let alone the only force driving the very um, severe dislocation uh, of the political system uh, and in part the new system uh, that we have uh, inherited from previous generations. Uh, for example, uh, some people have been very quick to suggest that it's because of the importance of social media in public communication in the US that, for example, Donald Trump could win the election on Tuesday. Personally, uh, I would like to see some evidence that that was a more important fa fact than, for example, uh, partisan polarization, uh, the sense of a great stagnation that meant that many white, uh, lower middle class people were relatively less privileged than they've been historically, or a sense of dis, uh, disenchantment and alienation from the political elite. I think we should really take care not to jump to conclusions about what drives these traumatic, dramatic developments around us. Um, and personally, I think um, the, the tendency to blame this on media, the moral panic, if you will, is a little bit of a cop-out in some ways. Uh, from the, I think, profoundly disturbing possibility that this might, uh, uh, this political crisis, if I can use that term, may in fact be precisely political, rather than driven by the development of digital technology. Other questions? Yes, yes, one here. Thank you for the excellent conference. I have a, a question related to your impression. What's your point of view in relation to what influence should be we, we doing or does the European Commission has a role to do in terms to regulate in inverted commas the role that Facebook and Google not being European actors but being very strong and relevant actors uh, within the universe of this globalization from a European perspective already Brexited thank you thanks very much um, 
I think there, from my personal point of view, there is no question that it's entirely legitimate to consider policy intervention in this space as it is with any other form of concentrated power. Um, I think the legitimacy of considering policy intervention does not necessarily logically or necessarily lead one to one particular set of conclusions about what kind of intervention. Um, and I think one, um, uh, one observation I would make that I think is sometimes gets lost in, um, in the rush to vilify uh, American entrance to European markets is that it is also the case that these platforms have enriched the lives of many European citizens um, and uh, any kind of sort of policy intervention, I think, should uh, consider, if you will, what balance can be struck between the interests of citizens, the interests of um, democracy, and the interests of um, incumbent industries, and then, indeed, of course, the similarly legitimate interests of new companies providing new services. I want to bring evidence to this conversation. Uh, I think it is. Uh, an important one, um, and I fear um, that it will be uh, driven, as these things so often are, uh, not only almost exclusively, but exclusively by special interest pleading. And I think if we can make just a little contribution to bring a little bit of um, independent research to that, uh, that is timely and evidence-based and speaks to citizens and policymakers so that they are empowered to make more informed decisions about this, I think that is a public service that we can try to rise to provide. Um, good afternoon. I would like to know if you think that the power of platforms applies when you consider Google Scholar and uh, whether this will empower researchers and the dissemination of science in the way you predict it necessary to make it more open or if it's just another way of indexing science and get, giving it to uh, the numbers of citations like uh, Google Citation Index. Um, thanks. That's a very interesting question. I haven't thought much of how this applies specifically to our own social practices. Uh, I, I will give that more thought, but just my immediate response, if you will. Um, I suppose, in part, the rise of things like Google Scholar is something that certainly makes my work as a scholar easier every day. I think it's a vastly superior to many other ways of trying to find colleagues' work, and it helps me in particular find the work of scholars that I do not already know through name recognition and their prestige and personal connection. So in that sense, I think it's very useful for me in terms of finding things that I should know of, but by people whom I do not know. Uh, of course, it also um, plays into the hands of sort of a rise of a sort of a regulatory regime in many universities that like, quite likes quantitative metrics. One can have other views on whether that is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, in terms of whether it will make the scholarship itself more publicly accessible, um, I suppose my view is that, that there the bigger issues may be about the way in which some academic publishers, not all, but some academic publishers, um, choose to uh, make uh, what we produce available or not available. And of course, our complicity with this, uh, because we as a profession have decided that we will uh, in large part decide the professional prospects of our colleagues on the basis of the prestige that we ascribe to what is often privately owned and operated proprietary for-profit journals. Uh, and of course, there are other scientific fields uh, who, who uh, operate in a different model, or at least in a mixed model, where open access uh, publishing and conference proceedings are much more important uh, to professional recognition uh, than only established legacy journals that are often uh, uh, licensed out to or owned and operated by commercial publishers, or in some cases, uh, nonprofit publishers. Any further questions? Thank you. Um, Rasmus, thanks very much for a great talk. I like the idea of platform power. As we start to think about the social consequences of platform power, i.e. the consequences for the possibility of a social world, I want to know your view about whether existing social theory can help us at all, or do we have to reinvent social theory? <laughs> um, thanks, Nick. Um, I, um, I have deep respect for the accomplishment of previous uh, traditions of social scientists and humanities scholars, uh, both theoretically and methodologically and empirically. Um, as I have been working with Sarah and with other colleagues to try to conceptualize um, this particular research project and the further research we hope to do in this uh, field, um, I feel that perhaps uh, the legacy that I'm proud to inherit uh, have been slightly less useful uh, than it has with some other things. 
Uh, I don't think that means we need to sort of burn down the farm and, and, uh, and start entirely anew. Um, but I think we have uh, quite a lot of conceptual work to do, uh, and I would be very happy to um, inv be involved in, in trying to think about what this means theoretically. And this is, if you will, a very modest initial attempt to sort of outline some thoughts on that. Next question in the front. Um, if I was clever enough, I would want to put together the two papers, but I'm not clever enough, so instead could I ask you, Rasmus, to reflect on some of Joanna's ethical considerations and how they might affect your work and also to pin you down with one particular question that then in terms of a possible ethical commitment to pluralism, uh, we in the Media Reform Coalition in the UK have just proposed, together with the National Union of Journalists, uh, that there should be a 1% levy on the turnover of Google and Facebook to support uh, non-profit journalism. I'm wondering what your reaction to that mm -hmm. would be and how that might fit into uh, the, the realization of particular ethical mm. positions. Um, thanks very much, Des. First, on the first point, um, I was very struck by the example of the image you showed that had traveled the world so quickly, uh, the tragic image of the young refugee uh, boy who drowned. And I think it's an example of how, um, as the gentleman who, who made a, a comment from the floor suggested that while we might think sometimes that images trivialize the distant suffering of others, I think it's also uh, a way in which to sometimes these things can be brought in a much more immediate and compelling way to our attention. Um, and I think this is one of the ways that, that I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm in, I think of myself as a non-positive empiricist. I would like to find out what does this mean uh, for our ethical relationship with the world. Um, and there are lots of people out there who sort of write dramatic polemical books about the shallows and the ways in which there's filter bubbles and whatnot. And then sometimes I fear we let our own conversations be driven by these sort of ad hoc hypotheses thrown out by public intellectuals rather than actually try to think from first principles. Um, I would like to find out. I don't know what it means ethically, but this was very interesting to, to think of that as, as one of several things from your uh, keynote that, that helped me at least ponder those questions. On the second point, um, I suppose my own um, view on regulation is, um, this is a personal view, um, there is no question that there is a market failure when it comes to the provision of public interest journalism. Uh, the market alone will not provide professional uh, independent journalism to the degree that I personally think is desirable for a relatively functioning and competitive democracy. Um, I think there are different interventions one can make in that space. Uh, public service media is one. Uh, direct subsidies for private sector media is another. Changing regulatory regimes to enable nonprofit media, which historically have been very difficult to run in many European countries, is a third. In terms of the specific proposal that you mentioned, personally, um, and I know this uh, perhaps reflects a bias of coming from a country in which sometimes these things are at least potentially politically possible, um, I prefer um, the idea of relying on general taxation and appropriations for funding public service investment um, rather than targeted taxes as individual organizations or entities for the simple reason that if Facebook becomes the new MySpace and if Google is overtaken by artificial intelligent messaging apps as the main way of, of, of sort of delivering content, then we will have another 20-year discussion before it becomes even in principle possible to think about whether those then should be taxed at 1%. So in that sense, I, I, I suppose I've let myself be informed by economists who suggest that one should try to sort of simplify taxation and then make uh, uh, appropriations on the basis of some assessment or political discussion about what the public interest is, rather than try to th tie things together specifically. But I'm very sympathetic to the intention behind the proposal. Perhaps uh, a couple of last questions. Maybe if I may allow to ask uh, a question myself. Uh, I was intrigued, of course, by your presentation of these various strategies uh, of uh, publishers, how to cope with the challenge posed by Google, Facebook, and other major platforms. You talked about cooperation, collaboration, coexistence. Has there been any opposition at all to these trends? Or have these media organizations sort of uh, accepted the fact that now is the time of the big giants and they have to accommodate to their demands? 
Um, thanks, Vaslav. I mean, I think the most, just very briefly, because I know people are heading off to business meetings now, but very briefly, the most important examples of opposition or conflict have been um, uh, News Corps in the US and the UK with uh, Mr. Murdoch um, has tried to confront very publicly Google repeatedly, but also other platforms on this issue. Um, for people in the room who may have sympathy with the substance of Mr. Murdoch's remarks, it may be an odd sensation to find themselves in the same position. Um, Axel Springer in Germany, uh, Matthias Döpfner, very pu publicly warned against the prospect that Google would develop into a digital superstate of unaccountable power. Um, in the US, a group of uh, major movie studios, uh, we now know from the Sony email leaks, got together on what they called Project Goliath to um, counter the uh, influence and power of a large technology company whose name at that time started with G and was not called Goliath, but something not so different from Goliath, perhaps. So there are examples of this, but the thing is essentially this, and this is why I, I, I have built so much and learned so much from Jose van Dijk's work on the culture of connectivity, is that the reason I think that this has not been a much harsher confrontation is precisely because of the combination of empowerment and dependency. Many of these media organizations benefit materially and clearly from the power of these platforms and therefore embrace them, even as they also worry about the long-term implications. And this, coincidentally, is why, in my view, this is not an epic. This is not a story of you know, evil actors out in the world faced by good actors elsewhere in the world and some epic confrontation between the two. This is, if you will, more a tragedy different organizations who for understandable and at least partially legitimate reasons do self-interested things that in some cases works out great, but in some cases do not. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, um, so the time for our panel is up. Uh, thank you for the presenters and uh, thank you for the audience for the questions. Maybe those questions which could not have been answered or even asked will be carried uh, over to the lunch. And please join me in one more round of applause for the presenters and the audience. Thank you and enjoy the lunch. <laughs>